Brian. Thank you, Vipin, um, members and guests. It's a pleasure to talk to you today. We have to remember, following the two learned presentations before, that this is now a debate. And obviously, the pur purpose of a debate is to win the debate. And part of that uh, perhaps involves paying less attention to the facts than the previous two speakers. I must say, I've enjoyed making contributions to the society over the last 30 years. It sounds a very, very long time. And um, I suppose my thoughts on it are that probably by the end of this year, I intend to have stopped worrying about doing heart surgery, and I'll be devoting my attentions to avoiding having heart surgery. <laughs> um, I'm so old, I can't work the... Uh, Oh, here we are. So I suppose just to set the scene, I suppose I, I, I want to challenge you all a bit and say, are we really having the right debate here? Is the tension between these different uh, techniques uh, really that active at the moment? Uh, or should we have it be worrying more in the clinical arena about the tension between our ongoing attacks from our cardiological colleagues on coronary artery surgery? We've still, I think, got to consider the impact of continued focus on surgical outcomes, I do think it still remains a significant factor in discouraging young surgeons particularly from taking on higher risk patients and while we have PCI as an evolving viable option. What we've got to ask ourselves really in our medical centres across the land and across the world are the conversations that we're having. Let me ask you, in your medical centre, are you saying to the cardiologists we're really upset about the number of high-risk patients you're taking on for PCI, or are you saying to your cardiological colleagues, oh, hi, Bob, there's a patient on the ward who's very old with a bad ventricle and multivessel coronary disease. I wonder whether you'd think about doing PCI on her because I don't fancy much doing surgery. So, so these are the things to think about. Does the high One thing that's always troubled me about the high-risk label is does it really identify a homogeneous grouping of patients at all? Is there any difference really in a coronary operation in somebody who has got uh, a bit older, like me? Or, or should we be... Is there any prospect that we should be tailoring these different therapies to different patho pathophysiological situations? And the last thing I wanted to say is... The question for us is, should these surgical strategies really be comp competitive as they always seem to be, or can we in some way make them complementary by working together as groups of surgeons? So, so to just fuel the debate a bit more, we're, we're debating how to do uh, high-risk uh, coronary cases, but if we look at our activity in the Bristol Heart Institute, it's not clear whether the patients are voting with their feet or whether the surgeons are voting with their hands, but there does seem to have been a decline in the numbers of patients undergoing high-risk coronary artery surgery over the last 10 years. I should say that the percentage of patients has remained about the same, at about 30%, but there does seem to be a reduction in the overall number. So as far as the debate goes, we're having, we're having a squabble about something we seem to be doing less of. Um, I can't remember whether it was Andrew or Vipin, identified this difference across the world of the prevalence of, of off-pump coronary surgery. And one of the things that always entertains me about this is that we think that we're engaged in a scientific thing, but a lot of the time, off-pump coronary surgery often seems more like a religious thing, really. And, and if I look at the, the... Across the UK, of course, about 80% of operations are done on bypass, and about 20%, and that's been pretty consistent over a number of years. But if we look at it in Bristol, there have been wild swings in the prevalence of cor off-pump coronary artery surgery from a period in the early part of the noughties where there were a number of years where about 80% of the operations were done off bypass and about 20% on bypass, so the complete reverse of the national trend. But then we rediscovered the pump in the late 2000 and the noughties, and then we reversed the trend up until about 2015, where we more or less went back to doing 80% of 
patients on bypass. And now with the arrival of Umberto as an off-pump specialist. So the point about this is it, it, it's about personalities, it's about preferences of surgeons. It doesn't really seem to be about science. We've seen this slide before. If we focus a little bit on what we think about the early mortality, we've seen this slide before in Andrew's excellent presentation. And what this tells us is that um, in retrospective analyses of very big groups of patients, there does seem to be a mortality benefit from off-pump coronary surgery, and that does seem to be greater in the high-risk patients. But of course, these are observational studies, and the question is really in those situations whether you really believe that you can adjust for the differences in the patients within the two groups. Similarly, this big study, study from another meta-analysis from Kowalowski and his colleagues, a meta-analysis of the randomized control trial. We must still stick to that as our gold standard for analyses of these two te techniques does seem to show that there were benefits from off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting in the highest risk patients, although that did not include mortality. So in terms of randomized trials of high-risk coronary, trial, coronary artery patients, what do we know about that? There's much less randomized data about high-risk patients. Uh, Professor Taggart and Professor Angelini formulated a CRISP trial between Oxford and Bristol in about 2008, 2009 to test the hypothesis that OPCAB reduces mortality in high-risk patients. The cutoff was a Euroscore of five. It was an expertise-based randomization with 5,400 patients across 40 centers. And it was abandoned after recruitment of about 100 patients because we simply couldn't recruit patients. The surgeons seem reluctant to randomize patients at the high risk end of the spectrum. We do have some randomized data. The best of these is the GOTCAP trial, Degala, uh, where, where the patients do have a mean Euroscore of 8.2. And in that trial, there's no difference in death or major mortality up to 12 months. So, so the data from the highest quality trial in a randomized trial does not seem to show any difference in outcome between the two techniques. What are my personal thoughts on early mortality between on-pump and off-pump cardiac sur coronary surgery? I think that there are many observational studies employ exploring a range of risk profiles that show a reduction in early mortality and major morbidity with OPCAB. Those studies usually come from centres with recognised expertise in OPCAB. I think there's, there has to be a lack of confidence in the propensity matching because even OPCAB surgeons do terrible cases on-pump. And we know that those patients at the highest <coughs> risk of death or major morbidity represent a tiny proportion of the, of the patients on whom we operate. And even in the BHI, when 80% of the patients were done uh, off by bypass, uh, there was never any mortality difference between the two groups, despite all the terrible cases being in the, on the on-pump group. So I think that, for me, the large databases, the retrospective analysis, do seem to show a reduction in early morbidity and mortality, particularly at the higher risk end of the spectrum. The randomized prospective studies don't seem to show any difference in the risk of early death or ma major morbidity, even when higher risk patients have been included. And meta-analyses of randomized trials show no diff benefit in terms of death and some improvement in major morbidity. This trial from Umberto, he'll probably talk about it. I won't dwell on it, but uh, Andrew mentioned it, and, and I'm sure Umberto will mention it. I'll mention it. I just reference this. There's still the idea in my mind that we, we should be tailoring these techniques to the pathology, uh, and we seem not to be able to do that. I'm perfectly accepting of the point they made that with a very diseased ACNE aorta, we should be doing off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting. Why wouldn't you? But a lot of the literature seems very confrontational, and what we're seeing here is what we're really saying is that off-pump surgery has to be done by high-volume surgeons. And so I guess the only way of addressing that is not for an individual surgeon to say, oh, I'm going to do this case off-pump, because that's bad. And the complementary element of this is uh, that... Um, 
we should be employing the expertise of our off-pump colleagues to deal with those kind of cases. So that means that Umberto now can do all the patients with severely diseased ACNE aortas for, <laughs> for me. <laughs> what about the late outcome? I think we just... I, I, we intuitively, the short and long-term benefits of cabbage is related to having enough of the little tubes carrying the red liquid to the heart muscle. Um, it's hard to... There's nothing... We can completely remove the off-pump, on-pump argument for this. We know years ago that incomplete revascularization led to poor outcome, worse outcomes. We know that if you do three bypass grafts, any additional bypass grafts don't benefit you in terms of long-term survival. We, we discovered that before we invented off-pump coronary artery surgery. So, so we don't have to apply that argument. It, it's got no connection to the two techniques, really. If, if the technique has um, a smaller mean number of grafts, then the frequency of incomplete revascularization is higher in pretty much all OPCAB series, although I do expect, accept it doesn't have to be. Um, the biggest randomized trials have equivalent grafts, but in the real world, off-pump surgeons seem to do less graft. And I can't seem to make this machine. In terms of the long-term survival, there are many meta-analyses like this showing somewhat worse long-term uh, mortality, and I think with the lower incidence of... Um, gra the, the, the lower... Uh, numbers of grafts, I, I would be surprised if that wasn't the finding. So what can we say about uh, late outcome in terms of survival? We can say that some of the best randomized clinical trials, like the coronary study, showed non-inferiority at five years, which in a way is good. That shows that you can do it. Um, I think most of the meta-analyses of randomized control trials overall seem to show a significantly worse or all-cause survival at five years. And when we look at the propensity-matched observational studies, um, they do seem to show a significantly worse long-term 10-year survival for OPCAB in about 80,000 patients. So, so the longer-term data from some of these very good randomized controlled trials, like the coronary study, uh, aren't yet available. We should say something to, to question Bob, who's coming along in a couple of presentations about robotic-assisted hybrid approaches. Something for you to think about. We're looking forward to his presentation. He's come a long way. We welcome him. Robotic procedures are very clever, for sure. I'm sure we're going to be impressed. Do they take ages? Probably. They do, in my experience. <clears throat> Is it realistic in our impoverished second-world country in the throes of Bex Brexit to buy loads of robots? <laughs> Probably not. Can it be applied <laughs> widely? Yes, Bob, we'll wheel round this elderly diabetic woman with a high BMI from the cath lab. She's in difficulties. Wheel out the robot. And I suppose my challenge to that technique is that I've always thought that if we're going to do a mid-cab and we're going to do multi-vessel PCI to supplement that as a hybrid, we might as well just do multi-vessel PCI. And I want Bob to per uh, persuade me that that's not the best approach. Well, I haven't told him I'm asking you that. <laughs> so my conclusions are that OPCAB, it's OK. I don't object to anybody doing it. I don't think it's been shown to have any significant benefit in terms of early outcome in randomized control trials in comparison to conventional cabbage. We simply can't ignore the obvious flaws in observational studies despite risk adjustments and they just can't be accepted as evidence of benefit of OPCAB. Late outcome and survival at five and ten years appear to be better for conventional surgery, most likely as a result of the lower rate of incomplete revascularization. Big surprise. And hybrid robot assisted revascularization techniques remain a developing technique which should continue to be evaluated, but it remains to be seen whether they'll remain part of the future forever. That's all, folks. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs>